Morning, sorry for being late. Well, almost late, right? Everything's right on time. I think I'm switched on here. You can check me out. All right. Well, happy Sabbath. Glad to see you each this morning. Enjoying the spring so far? Oh, praise God. Yeah, me too. I've enjoyed uh, seeing buds on the trees and everything else. I have a story to start with, and I know you did uh, scripture reading in Psalm 51. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I decided that I needed a change in life. After about, oh, eight or nine years of skateboarding, I wanted to change things up and try something different. So at a party over at uh, one of my friend's houses, I uh, decided to try smoking. I smoked uh, three cigarettes at 16 years old, three menthols, as I recall, and ended up throwing up in the front yard there. And what a change that was. Um, many of you may not know, but for Filipinos, um, the rite of passage into manhood includes starting to smoke. So I had that in the back of my mind, and I uh, thought, well, I'm 16 years old, it's time to be a man, and took that up in my life, and um, got addicted to cigarettes uh, at that age, and, and I remember then being at my house a couple months later, and, and wanting so bad to have a cigarette, and 16 years old, you don't have tons of money, so I, I knew that uh, my mom had, had a collection of 50 cent pieces, you know, the ones with uh, JFK on, on the front of them. She had been collecting these things for years, just, uh, just hoarding them up, you know, she liked doing that, getting the different years and whatnot, and I knew where they were. So I stole some of my mom's uh, 50 cent pieces and went, went up to the corner store and, and uh, bought myself some cigarettes and did this probably f over the next three or four months and uh, depleted her stack. Needless to say, when she found out what I had been doing, her heart was broken. And of course, uh, I felt really bad for all that I had done, and, and uh, there's no way to have replaced all of those coins. But by the time I turned um, 20 years old and uh, I was baptized, I knew that I had to make things right. So on Christmas, um, oh, back in the 90s, 90, 91, 92, um, I bought her a little treasure chest and filled them up as much as I could with the 50 cent pieces, 50 cent JFK coins, and gave them to her. You know, when we repent, when we want to turn things around, we try to do things better. We try to make things right again. And that's what we have when we look at the book of Psalms uh, in, in chapter 51. If you'd look there with me, we'll start off here a little bit. And you have to realize that there is a story behind Psalm 51. There's something that's going on here that, uh, that has brought this out of David. And of course, it was David who wrote this particular psalm. Read just a little bit, then we need to refer back to the actual story of how all of this came about. So Psalm 51, verses uh, 1 and 2, David, you can just hear the anguish of his heart. He cries out, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now, what has brought this on? Why has David thrown himself at the mercy of our Lord? Why is he saying these things? And it's important to get the backstory. so we need to do that this morning. If you turn your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, the way our Bibles are arranged is into different sections. What you have in the beginning, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, is what's called the Pentateuch, the first five books. Then after that, you have the writings, including uh, Joshua, Samuel, uh, Ruth is in there, uh, Kings, Chronicles, etc., all the way up to uh, Job. And you have the writings inside there. But we're turning to 2 Samuel and chapter 11. Now, David at this time is king. Uh, David was about 30 years old when he became king of Israel. This was after the first king of Israel, uh, Saul, who turned out to be a stinker. You can read up the story on, on him and everything that happened with him. But here we have David. Now David in the Bible is one that early on in his life 
was declared to be a man after God's own heart. But then we have incidents like this in 2 Samuel chapter 11 that occur that let us into the inner workings of a person's life, of how they lived and the mistakes that they made. And this definitely is a mistake that David makes. It happened in the spring of the year of the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now this is a dastardly thing. Of course, we label this as adultery. One man laying with another man's wife. Not a good thing. But the extent of how far David is willing to go in this course of action is revealed in the rest of the chapter. You can look at that. We don't have time to go through all of that this morning. But essentially, David has Uriah, Bathsheba's um, husband, killed in battle. Then we come to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And I love this parable. Nathan the prophet. By the way... If you've ever longed to be a prophet or to hear God's voice and to be called to do things, that's something that is reserved for those that have a very keen sense of knowing exactly what God is calling them to do and to obey him uh, when when they're called to do it. It's not an easy task. It's not something that that I think we'd want to envy um, because God calls us to do things like what Nathan is called to do here, to say this to the king of Israel, of all people. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. And he came to him and he said, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And notice David's reaction to this. Verse 5, so David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Now, you catch how passionate David's reaction is. First he says in verse 5, this man needs to die, and then he says in verse 6, well, and then also he needs to repay fourfold for what's going on here. I mean, logically, it doesn't make much sense because if you kill the man, how is he going to repay anything, right? But that's how passionate David is here in this instance. Then verse 7 is laid out the truth of the matter. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. You remember that Saul had chased David all around and, and tried to kill him. Verse 8, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Why have you killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword? You have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And by the way, David is known as as a man of blood in Scripture. And and as he comes to the end of his life, as he gathered all these materials to, to build the sanctuary that Solomon, his son, built, he was not allowed to do that because of all the war and all the bloodshed that that he had caused. Uh, Verse 11, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives... You know, uh, there's a story, of course, of Absalom, his son, that uh, tried to 
uh, cause a revolt before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. So David said to Nathan, and I'd stop right there, because David, at this point, you know, if this had been any other ruler, filled with pride, filled with self-concern, filled with, with what a power and authority I am supposed to have and I'm supposed to do and I'm supposed to, to um, execute over Israel. If this had been any other person, they may probably not have reacted in the same way that David did. David here in verse 13, to his credit, says this, I have sinned. You realize that David at this point, hearing all of this from Nathan, could have said like this, get him out of here, just like that. Nathan could have just been thrown in a pit, killed right away, you know. I don't want to hear any more of what God had to say, you know. I don't, I don't want to know what God's direction is. I'm just going to keep going in the way that I want to go. He could have been like that. But that's not David. David says, I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. So this is a context that we have for Psalm 51 as we get into this. This whole great episode of sin that David gets involved in. So let's turn there together, back to Psalm 51. Have mercy, verse 51, uh, chapter 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Maybe you're like me sometimes. Maybe you, you think to yourself, if I was in control, if I could be governor, if I could be this, if I could be that, if I could hold these important positions, I would make some drastic changes. The thing is, God knows the inclinations of our hearts and what decisions we would make. There is a reason we are where we are. It's hard when we look at somebody like David to just judge him. Because if we would be put in his position with the power and authority and everybody bowing down to him, would we have walked a different path? Many of us, I believe, would have just been worse off than David. So to his credit here, as we read Psalm 51, we learn something of what it means to repent. And this is not just from anybody. This is from the king of Israel, the one in control. If we were to see a world leader today, our president any leader from Europe, any, uh, anybody from Russia, you know, like Vladimir Putin, you know, if we were to see them write something like this or to act like this, it would stun us. It would completely take us aback because this is not the way leaders are supposed to behave. Yet David does this. David acknowledges, verse 3, I acknowledge my transgressions. When our leaders are in the wrong, what do they tend to do? Lie, 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 cover up, deny, deny, deny. That's not David. I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is always before me. Verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak. And when, when he says that, verse 4, you may be found just when you speak, I believe he's referring back to Nathan, that whole parable that Nathan puts out for him. And blameless when you judge. Um, very important here. David brings out what's necessary for each of us to experience as Christians. And it's repentance. It's confessing what we've done wrong. It's bringing to God, yes, what he already knows, but for our sake to bring to him our wrongdoings. This whole passage of scripture is reminiscent or, or is infused in another passage in the New Testament. If you turn there with me to 1 John 1 verse 9. So towards Revelation, but uh, before that, there's uh, John's writing. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. And this is a worthwhile text to underline and to have in, uh, in, in your Bibles to, to have memorized. 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, 
he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. First John 1 John 1.9, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, what is necessary for us to be forgiven of our sins? What's, what's, the, what's necessary? What has to happen so that our sins can be forgiven? Well, verse 9, I heard many of you mumbling it or saying it out loud. When we confess our sins... You know, human inclination, the tendency of the human heart is to not confess, is to hide, is to be like those leaders that we're so prone to judge, to deny, 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 lie about it, cover it up, uh, nobody else knows about it, why should I worry about it? The thing is, God knows about it, and he calls us to confess our sins to him. Do you know something that's interesting about, uh, about God? Not only does he know the sins that we have committed, Not only does he have a record of that, and he knows where we've been at, what's confessed and what's unconfessed. Not only does he know that, but he knows the sins that had we been given the opportunity to do, we would have done. Do you realize that? If we were placed in a position to commit certain sins, he knows which way we would have gone. The human heart is deceitful above all things, right? And desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, God knows it. God knows the human heart. And he knows our inclination towards wrong. I don't think sometimes that we really see the kind of condition that we're in as human beings. I don't think we we understand where we really sit in the cesspool of sin that's in this world. What we're surrounded by and how we're influenced. I think we try to pacify ourselves and try to fool ourselves into complacency, into doing nothing. But God calls us to repentance. God calls us to confess our sins. No, he doesn't send us a Nathan the prophet. And sometimes we need that, right? Sometimes we need a good friend or somebody to come to us and say, listen, you've done wrong here, and you need to make things right. But oftentimes, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts our conscience and lets us know where we have gone wrong, where we have fallen short. If we confess our sins, and the promise is here, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Oftentimes, I think um, we want to place God in heaven like this, you know, just angry at us and doing the whole uh, school teacher routine, doing this at us, wagging the finger at us and stuff. The thing is, God wants us to come to him so that he can clean us. The analogy that I use is that when my kids come in from the outside and they're all muddy, what I want to do is clean them up. I want to throw them in the tub so they don't track dirt all over the house and make a mess. When we come to God all messed up with sin, his reaction is like a good parent. He wants to clean them up. He wants to purify them, and make them better. And that's the promise here at at the end of this chapter. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So not only does God just forgive us and just give us a pass or a waiver, but he cleanses us. Not only does he save us in our sins, he saves us from our sins. He pulls us up out of that mud pile of sin and cleanses us and then tells us to go and sin no more. That's the purpose of the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel, that you do not have to be enslaved by sin. You don't have to be held down by the things which beset you in life. You don't have to keep cursing. You don't have to keep smoking. You don't have to be prideful anymore. You don't have to lust anymore. That's the good news of the gospel, that Jesus sets us free and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Now let's turn back to Psalm 51 together. Psalm 51. And I think about, uh, I think about those that like to cover up their sins, unlike David. And, and the simple idea that comes to my head is, is what my sister did to me when I was, oh, all of four years old and she was three years old out on the island of Kauai and... Um, and I probably told you this story. She, we were out there playing with the cap guns, like this, you know. And she took one of those cap guns and threw it in my head. Bam, 
right off my head. And of course, I was sitting down crying. Ah! My mom comes outside and says, what happened? And my sister says, the wind picked up the gun and threw it. And it hit him in the head. You know, we try to cover up our sins. So that's, that's what my sister uh, did there. Uh, you get a good laugh from that nowadays. But, but that's essentially what we do. You know, we try to blame other things. We try to, try to, try to put the blame someplace else rather, on, rather than on what, where it belongs. And that's why I love King David. He tells us, verse 3, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Well, move on to verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. You know, hyssop was a plant, just a point of reference. This is what um, the Israelites used to t- paint the blood over their doorposts uh, whenever the, the Passover was celebrated. They, they'd use that plant. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So we see this reflection back to or forward to 1 John 1, 9 of being cleansed and being made whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. Then we come to our scripture reading. Verse 10, and this is the heart transplant that each of us needs. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. You know what it means to be a Christian? It means to dwell in the presence of Christ. David understood that. David knew that it meant to be close to his God. And his sin had removed him far away. That's why verse 11 he says, Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Then verse 12, Restore to me the joy of Of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Do you know what it means to be blessed? Do you know what it means to receive the blessing of God? Literally translated in the Bible, that means to be happy. But it's not just happy like a ha ha kind of joke happy, it's contentedness in the Lord, it's being grounded in. In the Lord. At this point, as David's writing this, you can hear the anguish of his soul. He wants to be blessed once again, but that blessing has been removed. So he's asking, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirits. This is what he longs for. And then, verse 14, as we move on, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. And we think of Uriah the Hittite there the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Verse 17, and really verse 17 ends this psalm, just as a point of historical reference. Verses 18 and 19 were added at a later time, during uh, Nehemiah and Ezra's time as they were rebuilding Um, Jerusalem. But verse 17 really ends this for us. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Tears that are shed over our sins. Repentance that's genuine, knowing that we have done wrong. Not just out of of, uh, of practice, not just being forced to do this. This is not something that can be made or, or fakely presented to God. It's a genuine artifact of repentance when we bring a broken spirit and a contrite heart to God. You know, the Romans used to do something very disgusting. And I'm sorry to do this before uh, potluck. I, I presented this to uh, Fenton just earlier, and my wife said, yeah, I like the sermon, but I didn't like that illustration. But I'm going to tell it to you anyway. Okay? <laughs> so you guys are going to have to put up with it. What the Romans did uh, with those that were extreme offenders who had committed bad, bad crimes is they used to take a cadaver, a dead body, and tie it directly to the offender. And they would be sentenced to live with this body face-to-face on them for as long as they could. And, of course, the effects... You can imagine how horrific that was. The smell, the stench, the weight of carrying this thing around until they were just so exposed 
that they would, that they would die. That's disgusting. Don't think about it when you eat potluck. Okay, the thing is, each of us carries a dead body. It's ourselves. It's our own sinful nature that we carry around, that we have to deal with. It's always trying to corrupt us. Uh, just after the sermon at Fenton, also, a man came up to me and said, You know, Pastor, I really struggled when I was baptized because I thought when I was baptized, I, I was just going to overcome everything. I was going to have no more temptation. Everything was going to be just fine. But he said, The temptations just seemed to get worse. Things just seemed to get bad. And then I read Romans chapter 7, and that set things straight for me. And I want, to, want you to turn with me there. Romans chapter 7, in conclusion this morning. Romans 7. And towards the end there is where we're going. Romans 7 and verses uh, 24 and 25 is where we're at. And of course, Paul is lamenting the struggle that all Christians face, this war of the flesh bringing him down and, and him not knowing what to do, him knowing what's right in the mind, but still struggling in the flesh to do what's right. And he says this, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's what each of us has this morning, a body of death. We're all headed in the same direction towards death. But more than that, each of us has a body that's inclined to fool us. Each of us has a heart that wants to go the wrong way. But the solution, of course, is verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's only one solution when it comes to dealing with sin, when it comes to dealing with all that we've had to do with. Now, I told you a very disgusting illustration of what the Romans did. The reality, though, of the gospel is that Jesus willfully latched himself to all of us, to all the human race, and willfully died for those sins, so that through him we can overcome our sins. If we confess our sins, if we bring them to him, if we acknowledge that we have done wrong, Jesus is just and righteous not only to forgive us of our sins, but to cleanse us of our wrongdoing. How many of you want to be cleansed of your wrongdoing? This Sabbath, today, how many of you would like to be cleansed from your wrongdoing? I'll raise my hand. I'll tell you honestly and truly that I struggle. Each of us is in the same cesspool, right? There's not one of us sitting on top of a mountain looking down at all the rest. No such thing. Each of us struggles with the same flesh, with the same temptations. If David, the king of Israel, could be so open with his own transgressions and so willing to want forgiveness, I think it behooves us to want that same forgiveness and to be as open with the Lord as he was. What a good example he was, not in his sin, but in his repentance, in him wanting to turn things around. My prayer for us this morning is that we learn from David. We learn what it means to open our heart to God, to let him know where we've gone wrong, that we can be cleansed from our unrighteousness. That's my prayer for us this morning. Let's go ahead and sing our final hymn.